Take away, Catherine. Wait for the Sweet. Well, um, we are going to be transported to a winter wonderland and talking about um, how snow affects wildlife. So I um, focus on camera traps and use snow from the camera traps to understand how um, animals interact with their winter landscape. And the big idea behind this and kind of like my little corner of research is that when you're looking at a camera, um, we've heard over and over and over again that you know usually only about 20% of that information is useful. And that's because that's, those are the um, images with your animals. But I'm really interested in that other 80% of your camera trap data, and that's that um, body catch information. So that environmental information that the camera um, is taking images of, um, maybe just um, you put a time-lapse, uh, like a time-lapse setting on your camera, or maybe it's just like that empty, image and can we get the environmental information from that too because then we know exactly what is happening um, in the environment for our animals. Um, when the animal's in the image, it's exactly when they're experiencing it. And when they're not in the image, it's still that broader context for um, the habitat or the ecosystem that animal is living in. So in this image that, or the video that I keep playing, we see that there's um, a link in the image. There's a couple, um, there's some links sometimes playing. We also see snow. Um, if you wait long enough, we'll see some weather. And so um, my work is, yeah, pulling all the snow information and the wildlife information to tell a story about what's happening. Um, and the work that I do is in a system in Norway. So for this uh, summer school, the little chunk that I bit off was just trying to detect weather. Um, there's a whole other part that's trying to detect snow and extract indices the same way that we do from satellites. So like a normalized snow index, can we get that? Um, from our cameras and then correlate to, to that to satellites for like cloud gap filling and whole, like a whole other set of things. But for this summer school, we're just talking about weather. And why do we care about winter weather and wildlife? And that's because our winter weather is changing. There's tons of climate research that focuses on uh, rising temperatures and how that's affecting ecosystems, but there's not nearly enough work on how changing precipitation as a result of climate change is affecting our ecosystems and our wildlife. So in the winter time, when animals, grazing animals like deer need to get to vegetation. So you can tell that I do not study plants because that's my rendition of a plant. <laughs> so how a deer will get um, vegetation, they'll do this thing called cratering where they use their hoof and they'll dig out a little crater and get to the vegetation underneath. And um, in the winter um, with these rising temperatures, we're seeing more midwinter rain. And so when it rains um, on the snow, and then followed by a refreezing event, there's this ecological phenomenon called locked pastures. So that uh, vegetation is no longer accessible to the deer. And these, there have been studies that these locked pastures can have detrimental effects on our wildlife. So this is, um, the first study was on reindeer in Svalbard, which is an island off, like way off of Norway. And then another one was a study in caribou. So these studies though are pretty ad hoc because this weather information is really, really hard to get at the scale that we need for our animals. Um, in the second study that where they talked about the caribou was like in a paragraph at the very end, which was just like, we had this remote sensing data about rain and snow. And like, we think it's affecting our caribou, but like, we're not really sure. And um, the second one was again, like they had this huge die off in ungulates and then they were like trying to figure out why. So just studying and getting data on rain on snow would already be a huge contribution to being able to study these effects on animals and recognizing that they're gonna happen more and more in the years to come with um, increasing temperatures. So my work, um, this is just like a scary slide from my candidacy exam where I'm showing just how hard it is to get rain on snow. Um, it's currently, this is like using satellites at six kilometers. And so my work for the school was like, can we get that from cameras? And then we have it at a much finer scale. And um, so the big question is how does rain on snow affect our wildlife? The question I'll be answering um, for the ecology is looking at how rain on snow is affecting displacement, um, like habitat use. You could also look at population estimates. Um, but for this course, we're not so focused on that. We're really focused on trying to use computer vision to accelerate our ability to detect these rain on snow events at finer scales. So um, yeah, that's why for this project, I was kind of just the weather person trying to look at rain and snow and seeing if we can distinguish the two. And the problem is, is that distinguishing between rain on snow is really, really hard visually. So just thinking about this as a computer vision task, I knew would be a little bit complicated because in these two images, we have a wolf on the left that looks like it's maybe some snow. 
And on the right, it's rain. But even to the human, this is really, really hard to ground truth. And that's something that we talked about in our lectures. It's just, you know, when the model, if the model were to predict, predict this label, can we be absolutely sure that the computer and the model is right? Um, and so when preparing for this school, I tried to prepare a data set that we could be as confident as possible in the labels that we were actually feeding into the model. So um, the data set that I work with is from a really large scale camera trap network based in Norway. So these cameras are spread, there's over a thousand all along um, these boreal areas because the nonprofit that I work with is um, interested in observing the uh, recovering Eurasian lynx um, in Norway and Sweden. And uh, lynx are also snow adapted animals. So understanding snow and this rain and weather question um, is really interesting to them. But then preparing this data set, we went through and just labeled a bunch of images for weather. Um, and we have a, like a slightly imbalanced data set, which is not surprising. Um, we only used images that we were really confident in. But the, what we recognized when we were labeling was that it was really hard to look at a image in isolation and see it as rain or snow. We would end up having to look at the image like before or after and use that information to say, okay, it's snowing here and then there's like more snow and the image right after so like that image is like definitely snow so we were really careful about trying to get a high quality data set um and then so and for um the last three weeks we um have three years of data we put two years of data into the training uh the training split and then the test data will be a third year but then the other thing that we did was add um, information from a University of Washington hydrology study that was looking at um, just modeling snow. And they also happened to have cameras. And with these cameras, they had a device that uh, measures the brightness of rain falling and snow falling. And you can just distinguish between rain and snow that way. So we threw all that into the training data too. And so that was a way to basically try and um, increase the quality of our data and try and have a better, a better model. Um, so that's the final breakdown um, of the rain, snow, and none categories. And we, in my labeling, I had like fog and other, but I just didn't use that for the purposes of this class. So just focused on those three categories and seeing if we can just get a model to model the differences between those two. And then for um, my test split, um, I took one good year of data from 2018 to 2019. This is also in preparation because I'll be going back to Norway this winter. And so that will be kind of like that final, final split um, at the end, but trying to basically see, can we accelerate this data processing for getting to a place of just being able to recognize rain and snow in these images. Um, this is kind of a lessons learned thing. I was really ambitious and I was like, I'm so excited for the summer school. I'm gonna run everything super big. And that just really wasn't worth it. So downsides everything to 500 by 500. And I don't think we lost any information there. Um, and for this uh, class, I was using the ResNet classifier. And the thing I was really interested in was trying to see if we could use time context and time information to influence the, or increase the accuracy of our model. So instead of just presenting a um, model with a rain or snow image in isolation, could we present it also with an image before and after the same way that we do while labeling? And would that increase the accuracy? So I'll show a slide, um, I'll have, I have a slide next that shows kind of how we set that up. But um, I had one model that was just like a straight binary classifier, like weather or no weather. So grouping rain and snow together, and then a multi-class classifier that was breaking up like no, no weather, rain and snow. And then you'll see the different um, time deltas that I'm defining to basically see how we can use sequences and time to influence this accuracy and whether or not that works. Um, so this is just an example of a sequence um, and how uh, when you're looking at these images, people who work with camera traps, you know, maybe you have a couple time lapse images per day and you could think about using, you have your image of interest and then a before and after. But with snow and rain, one thing that's kind of arbitrary is just like how much time before and how much time after is really important because for a model to pick up a signal, maybe there needs to be like a lot of snow after or something like that to basically influence that accuracy that there's going, but that image of interest is the snow image. So I was playing around a lot with that this week. And um, the different time deltas that I decided was um, none, which is the like just presenting the image as itself with like no time information at all. 
And then um, sliding was just the image immediately before and immediately after. And that could be because these are motion triggered cameras that could be just seconds before or just seconds after, but I didn't actually define that at all. So it could be upwards of like, you know, anything, there's like no upper limit. So that's kind of um, the easiest sequence to make, but then also kind of the most, like the, the most flexible in how much time could be before and after. And then I also um, plucked images before and after from those other three time categories. So three to six hours, six to 12, 12 to 24. And um, the breakdown is just that if we didn't see an image in that time window, we just like replace the image of interest again in those like categories that were missing. Um, so the column on the far left is like the ideal sequences that we would want to influence time. Whereas the three columns to the right are kind of the like second, second best um, and third best scenarios. Sometimes the, the model just saw all three images um, or the same image three times. Um, but yeah, so now we can go ahead and see um, how it works. My, my initial prediction was that the images where we're just presenting the image on its own, all of that would just be in the RGB. So I presented it with all three channels, but in order to keep the same model architecture for um, those time categories, I had to substitute the color channel with those three images. So I lost the color information in those time categories. And my prediction was that since weather is like often triggering that infrared sensor in the camera anyways, and they tend to appear grayscale, it wouldn't, maybe that wouldn't really matter. And we would get more information from the time context, um, as opposed to just like presenting everything in color. Um, but we will see in a couple of slides that there's maybe some um, discrepancy there. So overall, the results are that the model is definitely detecting weather. Um, these are cases where we labeled the image as weather and with like 99% con uh, confidence, the model is also detecting weather. Um, so like in the bottom right, it's a nice picture of a moose with some snow falling. Um, and then in the like hypotenuse, there's like some rain and then maybe some snow on the top left. But um, let's see, this one is an example where the model is not doing so well. Um, we've got some image in the top left, like. The hard part is that it's just really, really hard to know from these Norway cameras if the model is actually picking up like a valid weather signature and our label is wrong, or um, if our label is right and the model is just detecting something like in the top left corner that could just be like humidity or haze or fog or something that's not actually drizzle or rain or the type of weather that we want to detect. Um, so that leads to kind of the discussions that we've been having about just being like really sure in what you're models predicting and having um, a test that where you can be absolutely, absolutely sure. And that's one of the drawbacks to this model is that I think we can be sure that there's, um, we want to be able to collect weather, but there's going to be, we almost want to err on the sides of more false positives and then use expert opinion to try and um, like fine tune these kind of harder to, harder to analyze cases. So those images were from that top um, RGB, just two class model. And um, here's the full like breakdown of all the different models in that set of experiments. And the F1 score is like not super impressive. Um, we were playing a game of like before we were in the model, how much it would get right. And all of us like were like, went, like thought it would be like 80%. So the fact that it was 50 was just like, is what it is. But um we, um, the thing that was interesting was that the time information didn't add, and like, it just doesn't seem like the model really got it. Like down here, it just seems like it's just predicting no weather every single time. So in the bottom three class case, the 0.33, there's only three classes. So it means it's just guessing like kind of randomly. Um, but the fact that the top model is, um, um, like looking at the top model and like really looking into the results. Um, I think one thing that this uh, encouraged me to think about was just like, we only need this, we don't need this model to do everything. Um, we really just need it to do one thing and that's detect these kind of rain on snow events. And if we wanted to do everything, there would be a lot more work to do and a lot more ground data to get. But just for the purposes of like using it in these ecology cases where we just want to be able to like quickly scan our whole set of images and pull out the cases that we can then go look and see if we can find these rain on snow events. This top model with that, even with the 0.52 might still be doing the job. So that was kind of where I was headed in the next steps of this analysis. Um, 
The confusion matrix, I think the part that I uh, became more interested in after staring at this model for a long time is just um, maybe we can't have a full classifier of like rain versus snow versus no weather just because rain and snow are so hard, but we could check weather and then maybe have some ground data or some other validation set to distinguish the two or some other signal. So um, in the confusion matrix, it's really the false negatives that I was like the recall that I was more interested in is like, can we boost our recall basically knowing that we're going to get more um, false negatives, but then we can go back through and like comb through that data. Um, looking at the 2018, 2019 time series. So this is now like flipping all of our, um, flipping all of our images, um, images onto the X axis for time and looking at when the model detected weather and when we detected weather, um, there could be some places where like we basically missed the weather. Um, this signal the we put our true labels like at half height, just to make it a little bit more easy to see what the, the model predicted. And this signal is actually like pretty com like kind of common in winter um, time series where you, in the shoulders, like October and April, you wouldn't see tons of weather events and then concentrate in the middle, you'd see a lot of weather events. So if I were to try and interpret this and take this back to my work, I would probably go back through like where this is detecting weather and give it a second look. We kind of wanted to be doing this. Like we kind of want it to be giving us like a lot of signals and then we can go through and like look at weather station data and then comb through and try and find these rain on snow events because they're happening at such a fine spatial and varying spatial scale that can be really, really hard to detect. Um, zooming in to just like one camera, um, we can see that time series like at a, at a finer scale. So on the far left is when um, our model and our true labels were matching. So we can look at some images there. In um, January, we have some false positives and false negatives. But again, if I were to take this back to my work, I think it's actually a good thing that we have like all this data because then we can then um, we can look at other signals and try and see and try and figure out when these rain on snow events were. But we could at least clear out like all these other images and like simplify some of that data processing. Um, so these are the examples where the computer and our the model and my labels match. So we've got some nice um, snow images. The hard part is that at like negative one degrees Celsius or like right around freezing. Um, it's probably sleeting, which is like truly a mix of rain and snow. So that just like makes this problem even harder. Um, here are our false positives. And um, so in the top row, everything but the box is something that the model was really, really confident was weather. And in the blue box is the only place that they matched. Um, but at least when I look at this, it actually seems like pretty reasonable for the model to be detecting these. And we could go through and in that top middle, um, it looks like it might like it, it's like sunrise maybe. So that might just be condensation. Like I think condensation is probably really throwing off some of these images. Um, Norway is the nonprofit. They realized all their cameras are set at 8 a.m. time lapse. And they realized in the winter that is just like the worst idea because it's super dark at 8 a.m. and really cold. So even for animals, they're not really getting the information that they need. So they're actually changing their time lapse to 12 p.m. So you could think even getting signatures like that might be a little bit louder or a little bit more apparent um, in future iterations of this model. Um, let's see, so here are the false negatives. I labeled these images as rain um, and the model um, predicted that it's no weather. Um, so this kind of leads into some ideas. I mean, even for me, I labeled it as rain, um, but I, I, I'm not totally sure. I'd have to look at like the whole sequence when I looked at this to see maybe I saw like wet pavement or something like that. But it is like, um, I think the model is doing like about what we would expect to do given the data it has been given. And in some ways, maybe we want it to keep doing this. And then we just to come, like we to go through in like a post-processing um, step to get the actual like rain on snow events. Um, so that leads me into the next steps. I didn't talk about this, but um, I'd be really interested. It seems to be picking up those like big globs for condensation. Um, but I'd also be interested in like adding Gaussian noise to sunny days just to make sure it's not like blurring edges, like reading blurry edges as weather. Um, but then since it seems like this recall aspect might be the best um, case scenario to utilize this model, we could lower that threshold for um, lower that threshold to increase the recall. But I think the part that I would also be super interested in is actually thinking about ways to combine this method with a more non-visual or just another step 
to think about how we can distinguish between rain and snow. So rain and snow sound super different. So you could add an audio moth and um, you could have this model do a first pass of just like finding weather, but then doing an audio to actually like, distinguish between rain and snow. Um, so there's like tons of other things that you can do to like basically play with this problem. Um, and um, here's just the wildlife stuff. So this is from that same camera from that same year. These are the detections of wolf and hare. So I definitely think this camera is in a wolf home range. Um, I was really hoping to get you, like show you all some like moose or deer. Um, but we, the next step would also be to incorporate this weather data into looking at like wildlife um, habitat use and like wildlife movement. So you can start to like accumulate all of these cameras together and start to see if there's like any um, connection between when weather is happening and maybe when predators and prey are, like predators are there when prey are there and vice versa. Um, the other thing is that I think besides like audio cues, you could just look at like snow depth. So sometimes people will put like snow poles in front of their cameras and watch snow depth. So you could use that to monitor rain versus snow. Um, this was, oh, I didn't talk about this, but this is my three, you could use your three class model that kind of gives you like a rough estimation of when the model thinks there's snow, um, rain and snow, and then go back to your images and filter that way. Um, so I think I am really excited about just using this as a way to like, ex like expedite processing for this images and then going back through and, um, and looking, taking a closer look myself. Um, you can also combine this, let's see, this graph is like really messy, but you could think about, this is like pulling the, like a snow fraction from the actual images, so like counting white pixels. And so you could combine that to basically see if like the fractional white pixels increases or decreases. Um, so there's like basically just like a ton of different things that you could do to basically think about your model, just breaking it down um, to just like being good at one problem and then adding other steps to um, get it to the place that it needs to be. Um, yeah, so lessons learned. I think um, pre-processing is super important. What's hard for computer, what's hard for humans will super be, will also be hard for computers. Um, and then of course, keeping the model simple was something that uh, we talked about yesterday. Um, and with that, I just want to say this has been a total blast in like putting the so and in bold, like doesn't emphasize that enough, but just want to say thank you to everyone. So cool. I just, I just love the diversity of what we're doing here. So cool. Um, so going off of your, your whole idea that like, okay, maybe I can just use my model to detect weather events, and then I can try to figure out whether it's rain or snow in a different way later. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, just like from my understanding of like hydrology and like precipitation. So I, I'm sure that this is like part of your motivation. It's like precipitation patterns vary super widely, um, just like from, from location to location. So like, you know, it might be raining in one camp or snowing or whatever, precipitating in uh, like at one camera trap location and not like, you know, one kilometer like to the, mm -hmm. to the side. But that's probably like not necessarily true. Like if there, there is precipitation at both of those camera traps, it's probably going to be either raining at both or uh, snowing at both just because temperature patterns don't vary quite as widely mm. as precipitation patterns. So I'm wondering whether given the knowledge that there's precipitation, can you figure out whether it's snow or rain based on temperature? temperature. Totally. Yeah. That I, the, there is work of using just temperature thresholds to decide rain versus snow. The hard part is that the temperature on these cameras is typically seen as unreliable because it's really influenced by um, like solar radiation that's somewhat mitigated when you're super cloudy, but it is hard to be absolutely sure that like the temperature that you're looking at is accurate. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that there's a lot of work that that, like, that temperature threshold also varies based on um, the humidity that you're in. So like the what I'm going to mess up the physics, but like the wetter that it is, like basically the temperature needs to be colder to like have snow or like vice versa. Um, so just like setting zero would be um, kind of misguided. You'd have to have like influence on those other factors. I think the, um, and then the last thing is just in this particular climate in Norway, it's a temperate climate. And so it tends to be like right at freezing. So you're just like Ooh. any level of uncertainty is like 
going like, yeah, just most of those images are at zero. So the extremes for sure, you can like be like, okay, it's like negative 10 degrees. It's like definitely snow. Um, but so much of these, um, like, a, and because of like rising temperatures and stuff too, is you're seeing a lot of stuff like fluctuate right around. Yeah. yeah. I was mostly just like wondering if like, you could literally just take like the output of like a, you know, weather forecast model, but it's probably super remote and everything. You just yeah. Make some sense. Totally. Yeah. Darn. <laughs> no, no, but I, I actually think that the, there's maybe a kernel there that is interesting, which is like, yeah, though there is a ton of low level variability, mm -hmm. um, there probably is shared spatial information at the same mm -hmm. time point. Yeah. So you could look at your map of camera traps. Like if you crank your, your recall way up, mm -hmm. right? So you, you use a threshold that's super, super low and you take like every possible prediction of snow or weather. weather yeah can you then try to filter that stuff out based on like low level like like meteorology information or like context mm -hmm. like all of that stuff those false positives that are coming from condensation in the right. morning like can you just say like look we, we know based on meteorological reports there's just isn't there aren't there's isn't yeah. any weather going on at all right now and so we can just filter this out mm -hmm. i think yeah definitely that yeah yeah mm -hmm. so maybe there's like a way to get a lot of false positives and filter them out with yes. information about weather, but also look at like, okay, if these cameras are really close together, mm -hmm. like maybe we can use the the spatial information to try to like re rank. Yeah. yeah. I think it's really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, it's so it seems like the, you were showing us the seasonal pattern of the weather events, you know, you're getting yeah. more snow and so forth in the, basically the winter months. And I was wondering, you know, are the scenes looking, is there, what do you think? Is it, is there, how, is there, might you have a problem where the way your scene looks because of daylight changes mm -hmm. is correlating with sort of like the kind of weather? Yeah, yeah that's happens. a really good question. Um, so many weather images are in infrared that it's like, I think that is like the hardest part is like, is the model learning just like grace, like grayscale infrared as weather, as opposed to like, you know, RGB color. Um, so yeah, I think I would like definitely be worth like poking at that a little bit more. Um, yeah, I th yeah, I think that's really valid. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering what the, like, <clears throat> when you showed the sleet and it was like, which one is it? Yeah, yeah. What's the actual environmental impact in terms of like the frozen part? Oh, of sure. Sea? That's a good question. Um, it would depend on the temperature that follows. So, like okay. for like using this ecologically, the thing you have to then look at is then what the temperature is um, the next day, because the sleep becomes um, more impactful for animals when it's really cold the next day, because um, that's when you get that like really icy crust. Yeah. Let's move to the next speaker. Thank you so much.